This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 216, recorded on January 18th, 2013. Hi everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello and you're listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. Welcome back. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. I think you only have one more missed episode coming up, right? Uh, That's right, except I just encountered the uh, person who runs the admissions uh, the other day, and she said that she may have to call on me again because they got a lot of students coming in and blah, 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 blah. Right. So there may be another one coming down the pike. I uh, hate to miss episodes, but, you know, that's all right. A, that, no that's problem. important work. We understand. How's the weather down there? Oh, man. The last, I don't know if this may have even been in the papers. Well, it's been warm elsewhere as well. But the last week, we had temperatures in the in the 80s. And bright, bright blue uh, sunshine, uh, bright, bright blue skies. Right now, it's cooling off. It's uh, sixty degrees. <laughs> What's this picture of you in a sailboat on tw- on Facebook? I saw uh, you, you sailing. Me. That's me sailing uh, last this week? weekend. Oh. Last weekend, yeah. In a light breeze, like I said, eighty degrees. I was wearing shorts to work last week, biking in in shorts. Mm. So we got sixty degrees, a few puffy clouds, uh, blue sky. It's gorgeous. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. You must be cold like we are, right? Oh, yeah. It's 24 Fahrenheit. Uh, it's um, <laughs> <clears throat> Last night it was 9, I think. So I, you that's know, I, was, I was up in Vermont uh, this week for a day, and it was cold there. Oh, oh yeah. that's We consider that cold from here. It's below freezing. I yeah. don't know what it is here because my... My uh, weather data aren't loading, but it's, it's blue skies and sunny, but it is cold today. Yeah. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's 29 it. degrees here at Fahrenheit, minus 2 Celsius, and it's sunny. Yeah, it's so. nice, isn't it? Yeah. Very nice great. out. Let me see if I can get the weather here <clears throat> before we go on. Here we go. Local weather, minus 3 Celsius. Below freezing. Yep. yep. And the next week are all pretty cold here, although no snow in the forecast. I guess winter's here, except mm-hmm. in Florida, of course. I can't even tolerate that stuff anymore. <laughs> I know. You spent many years in Buffalo, right? I did my time. <laughs> and you're making us know it, too. <laughs> all right. Today we have something we haven't done in a long time. And that's a Virology 101. I don't know if anyone cares anymore. It's been so I long. I care. Well, we do, but... A We've gotten people, a couple of people what? have mentioned in letters, you guys should yeah. do uh, Virology yeah. 101. So. Yeah. One person said, I consider it dead. Well, <sighs> resurrection is here. We're going to do a Virology 101. And uh, before we do that, however, two, uh, two follow-ups. Now, one, uh, last time... We talked about a rabies paper, and you remember Will had very urgent questions about how rabies got in nerves and was could be protected by antibodies. And we mentioned, well, you know, he's kind of he sent me like three or four emails and he posted on Facebook. So it, then it turns out he had a possible rabies exposure, mm. and he started post exposure prophylaxis two weeks uh, afterwards. And he was being told that that might be a problem if, in fact, uh, he had real exposure and he was trying to get some information. So I told him, you need an ID, Doc. Mm. But he's out in Oklahoma. So um, if any listener is near there and want to help out Will, he's over on Facebook.com slash This Week in Virology. Yeah, well, we, know about viruses. we know about viruses, but I wouldn't come to us for medical help. Nope. No. Nope. Not qualified. No. We could point you towards an ID doc, but I don't know any in Oklahoma. Yeah, his, his um, I mean, I assume he went to an emergency room or primary care doc, and uh, they should be able to um, to refer him if he's uh, if he's yeah. worried about that. 
Also from Rabies, Matthias Schnell, whose paper we discussed, sent a note on Twitter. Cool that you talked about our rabies paper. We did try to scan the brain, but the signal doesn't go through the bone. Mm-hmm. I guess we're talking about trying to see the green and the right. red through the brain so they wouldn't have to sack the mice, right? Mm-hmm. So there you go, right from the professor's mouth. And then finally, another one on the rabies story from fake Dr. Vance. I don't know who Dr. Vance is. Do you? Nope. No. When you were well, talk- I guess that's not him anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> when you were talking rabies and the red-green conversion in neurons, I couldn't help but think of Schrodinger's cat. Any worries? I, I suspect that Alan can handle this one. I'm not quite sure what the question is here. Well, you know what Schrodinger's cat yeah, is, right? Yeah, Schrodinger's cat is. I mean, is the concern that uh, did Schrodinger's cat have and not have rabies? <laughs> well, since we're looking at red-green, I guess the concern would be is the virus there or not at the same time? I don't know how that can be. No. Well, well, in the relativistic state, of course, a cat could be either alive or dead at the same time. That's the, that's a thought experiment, the Schrodinger's cat, right? Right. right. Cat's in a room... And there's some activity that's going to set off a poison. And in relativistic terms, there could be a state where the cat is both alive and dead. So I guess in terms of rabies, even though you're seeing one color or the other, I, I don't know. I can't wrap my head around it, to be honest. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what uh, analogy he's going for here. I don't think Schrodinger's cat had rabies because otherwise it would be dead. <laughs> its state was indeterminate, so... Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe because the because the neurons are surviving the infection, but they're not. Um, ah, maybe they're alive and dead at the same time. Yeah, they're alive and dead at the same time. But I, I don't know what the. Uh, I, I think this didn't fit in 140 characters. That's what I was just <laughs> thinking. Is that he needed to redo the 140 character yeah. usage? Well, you could just send us an email, but right. if he listens or she listens, you could elaborate. We tried. All right, Uh, Virology 101, this is going to be released as a video, but for those who don't want to watch the video, we will try and be clear. Uh, There will also be a PDF of all the slides, so you could follow along with that. Does this sound good to everyone? Yep. Sure. And this is about all about RNA processing. I think the last one we did was about transcription, right, Rich? Well, I'm looking at the whole list here because I think it's uh, good for context. There have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Virus structure, virus classification, virus entry into cells, virus genomes, making viral RNA, that's uh, transcription basically, reverse transcription, making viral DNA, making viral DNA 2O. What's the difference between making viral RNA and transcription? The making ah. viral RNA was RNA viruses making RNA, I think. Okay, ah. so that's like genome replication for RNA virus. Yeah. And transcription, and now following logically on that, uh, I guess we're going to talk about RNA modification. Right, RNA modification. So we're going to talk mainly about viral mRNAs here, which can be made by a virus enzyme. It could be made by a cell enzyme. It could be in the nucleus. It can be in the cytoplasm. But the common thing is that all of these have to be translated by the cell because viruses, uh, virus mRNAs are translated by the cell machinery. And RNA processing uh, really is a word for a series of covalent modifications that happen to the mRNA that make it appropriate uh, for being translated. And these include capping of the RNA and polyadenylation and... Splicing, which we'll talk about most of those. We did talk a little bit about polyadenylation last time. Uh, it'll come up here as well. So uh, let's go to the second slide. So the first slide is kind of like a title slide. So uh, yeah. So I don't. Uh, I don't get it. That's a splice. You know, I was wondering. It's two wires spliced together. Okay. I thought Alan would love that. That's excellent. I, it's it's a nicely done splice, by the way. Yeah, it's really all twisted back on itself and then soldered, right? 
Yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be done. So you give the physical strength with the twisting, and then um, you you solder it for the electrical connection. So there's a little bit of analogy to splicing, right? Yes. So okay. There's, there's no solder. <laughs> anyway, slide two is an overview of the things we're going to talk about. This is a, a cell, and we're looking at a nucleus. And in that nucleus, there's a double-stranded DNA template. And last time, the process we talked about was transcription, production of RNA from that template. And uh, what we're seeing here is that um, many mRNAs have short blocks of coding sequence, which are joined to uh, what are called intervening sequences, or introns. And those have to be removed uh, in order for the mRNA to get out of the nucleus. So we're looking at capping, we're looking at the production of a pre-mRNA with introns and exons, and then polyadenylation. Now, this figure is a little uh, wrong because transcription uh, splicing is typically co-transcriptional. Hmm. But for, it's hard to show on a figure. Mm -hmm. So right. it's shown in steps here. You have a mRNA with introns. It's removed by splicing. And then the another part of RNA processing is really export of the mRNA from the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it can be translated. So we're going to talk about these things today. Now, no viral genome encodes... Was harmed in the making of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. You're quick. Sorry, sorry, continue. You should do a podcast. <laughs> no viral genome encodes any part of the splicing apparatus. It's all done by cell enzymes. So the splicing is totally dependent on the cell, just like translation. And not every virus has to splice. If you... If you, if you um, are a virus that spends all of its time in the cytoplasm, you can avoid this. Right. Right. Now, it turns out that um, for the vast majority of cell mRNAs, splicing is needed for the mRNA to get out of the nucleus, and we're going to talk about that. But not every virus splicing, splices, as, as Rich said. So how does that happen? Well, we'll talk about that, too. Now, splicing is cool in many ways, um, one of the cool things is that for viruses, uh, it gives you a lot of opportunities for controlling gene expression after the transcript is already made. And there are ways to use splicing to increase coding capacity, to temporally control the production of proteins during infection, to selectively express proteins. So splicing is pretty versatile. And this is that's also true. I mean, those those are... Uh, benefits that the cell gets from splicing, too. Absolutely. Yes, of course. And of course, uh, as we will see, uh, this whole process was discovered in viruses. Viruses yes. lead the way. So let's start with capping here. Uh, there's, in this figure, we show first the production of a little transcript uh, with a cap on it. What is that all about? And the next slide, which is slide three, uh, shows the structure of a cap. And this is a... Um, in RNA, of course, the first two bases are shown, base 1 and base 2. And as everyone probably knows, nucleic acids are linked in a 5 to 3 prime direction. The riboses are joined by a, a, a phosphate bond, which is a 5 to 3 prime bond, as you can see in this picture. But the cap is an unusual structure because it's linked in a 5 prime to 5 prime way. And the cap is a G. GTP joined to the first base of the RNA in a 5 to 5 prime linkage, and all the phosphates are still left. The three phosphates are in between. So you have a G, three phosphates, and then the first base of the RNA. And between every other base, of course, there's a single phosphate, but the cap has three behind it. And the cap is typically methylated on the G residue on the base itself on the uh, seventh position, which is a nitrogen. There's a methyl group. And then... Uh, the first, first or the first and second bases of the RNA can also be methylated. So that that's, is that's kind of optional. Usually, that first methylation on base one happens. The second one is really optional. And right. in fact, there's a a paper that we need to talk about mm -hmm. that talks about how those methylations um, uh, are important for the innate immune system to recognize whether or not it's viral or cellular message. Right. Now, this cap is important for splicing. Uh, it, it allows recognition of uh, exons during splicing. It stabilizes mRNAs from 
nuclease digestion, and it's also very important for efficient translation. So this is pretty important uh, little thing we have here on the five prime end of the mRNA. All right. Are, yes, Kathy. Are all messages capped? No, there's always exceptions. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, organelle mRNAs in, well, cellular mRNAs in the organelles like mitochondria that are not capped. Uh, many viral RNAs are not capped, like coronavirus RNAs are not capped. Um, any, any others I'm missing? I think that covers it. Mm. So if you don't have a cap, you've got to have a special mechanism to initiate translation. <clears throat> yes. Right. And to stabilize the RNA and... Of course, polyRNA is not spliced, so that doesn't matter. Right, because the cell machinery is expecting a cap for translation. Yeah. So if it's not there, there's got to be some way of compensating for that. Uh, slide number four is a diagram of capping mechanisms. On the left is how cells cap their mRNAs. And... Um, this is done in a series of steps, starting with uh, the five prime end of the RNA, and the first phosphate. So that five prime end is made by DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Has three phosphates on the first base, and one of those was removed by a triphosphatase, and then GPPP is added by guanylyl transferase. So now you end up with GPPP and then the RNA and. My understanding is that the triphosphatase and the guanylyl transferase in the cell are part of the same enzyme. Yeah, it, uh, I can never keep this straight. Depending on what organism you're talking about, which cells, what virus, etc., the, the, the three activities that in total are responsible for making a cab zero, that's the triphosphate, the gu gu triphosphatase, the guanylyl transferase, and the methyl transferase can be on the same or separate enzymes. Mm. The organization is different depending on who you're talking about. How about just in cells? Is it always the same? I would uh, I'm so. not sure. Yeah, In viruses, I could see that that would be different, yeah. Uh, and then the methylases come in and add methyls to the G and then maybe to the next two bases, as Rich said. Those are, ap those are optional. And those last two methylations, so for example, in vaccinia virus, and I think this is pretty much the same for a lot of viruses, the cap zero structure, which just has the methyl group on the G, that's the basic structure. Mm. And in vaccinia virus, that's all done by one enzyme that has three different active sites on it mm -hmm. uh, for each of the three different uh, activities. And I think a lot of the other viruses is pretty much the same thing. And then the... Uh, 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 ribose methylation to make a cap one and a cap two structure. Well, in vaccinia, you only get you only get the uh, cap uh, cap one structure with the first ribose methylation. That's done by a different enzyme. Now, if you're a virus like vaccinia uh, and you replicate in the cytoplasm or uh, any other RNA virus that happens to be there, you need to encode your own cap adding and methylating mm -hmm. machinery. So as Rich mm -hmm. just said, you know, Vaccinia's got these factories in the cytoplasm. It's got to make all the enzymes, right? Triphosphatase, the guanylyl transferase, the methyl transferase, and other viruses too. So on this picture on the right, we have a schematic of how an alpha virus does this. This is Simliki forest virus. It's a positive strand enveloped RNA virus. This replicates in the cytoplasm, and it has to make its own capping machinery. And you can see that it's different from the cell pathway. It starts with the RNA, uh, and it takes a phosphate off with a triphosphatase, but then uh, it adds the GPPP, which has already been methylated. Mm. It's different from the cell, which puts the GPPP on and then methylates it. And many viruses have different ways of doing this, as, as you might imagine. And some of them also steel caps from cellular um, RNAs, right? Some of them do steel caps. And I believe we have a, uh, a slide summarizing that uh, okay. in a bit. All right. Uh, the next slide is number five. And this is meant to show you that, on a DNA template at least, capping occurs co-transcriptionally. And so here we have a double-stranded DNA template and a red arrow showing the promoter, the place where uh, RNA synthesis initiates. And we're showing RNA polymerase to making a a little RNA, a transcript, which is green. 
And then after 20 or 30 nucleotides, uh, the transcript is capped. So it's only after a little bit of the mRNA is made it, that it gets capped. And it's capped by the capping enzyme. And the way the capping enzyme is recruited is the RNA polymerase is actually phosphorylated on its C-terminus. And that's a signal for the capping enzyme to bind. And then capping enzyme binds and caps the, uh, the RNA. Yeah, I think of this as, among other things, the... Uh it takes you got to synthesize a few nucleotides before the RNA even emerges from the enzyme. Yeah, and at least in the case of vaccinia, where this has been uh, uh, figured out, uh, the uh, uh, it's not quite the same, but it's similar. And the cap is added really as soon as the five prime end of the RNA uh, emerges from the enzyme. So it's uh, pretty quick. So it's same in vaccinia. Pretty much. Yeah. Doesn't have a C terminal domain. Blah blah blah. Mm. But. Uh, you know, overall, it's about the same. And this also explains why other messen- other RNAs made in the cell, uh, tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs, don't get capped. It's because their polymerase, their RNA polymerases don't have the C-terminal domain. Hmm. So that uh, doesn't mm-hmm. allow them to have that signal. And mm. uh, so, so yeah. tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs don't get capped. Yeah. All right. Next slide is a table summarizing how these um, how viral RNAs, mRNAs, are capped, and um, there are three three sections. One is synthesis by host cell enzymes. So many viruses replicate in the nucleus, like adenoviruses, herpes, papillomas, etc. They use Pol2 of the host to cap their mRNAs. And then there are a bunch of viruses, either RNA or DNA, containing viruses that uh, make their own capping enzyme, as we said. And the pox viruses are there, but rheoviruses, rhabdoviruses, togoviruses, they all encode their own uh, system, and it's part of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And then, as Alan mentioned earlier, there are some viruses that steal a cap from cellular pre-RNA, pre-mRNAs or mRNAs, and that includes influenza viruses and bunya vi- viruses. Uh, so as, Vince, as, as Vincent mentioned before, um, this, the whole capping phenomenon was actually discovered in viruses. Right. And uh, so, uh, and I was, I was actually looking some of this stuff up because I was curious. I knew a couple of labs who were involved in this, and I was interested in sort of what came when, so I fired off some emails yesterday. One to a friend of mine who uh, is uh, knowledgeable in the field but was not directly involved in the discoveries who <clears throat> says that um, uh, his feeling is that Aaron Shatkin and Bernie Moss uh, share full credit for the elucidation of the cap structure. And he says that uh, Hiro uh, Furuichi is the unsung hero because he brought the project to uh, Shatkin's lab from Japan where with Miura, he showed that cytoplasmic polyhedrosis virus RNA synthesized in vitro by virions has a blocking methylated nucleoside at the 5' prime end. The really uh, entertaining email, <laughs> gripping, yes. is from uh, Bernie Moss, uh, who said, uh, Rich, here are my vivid recollections. Aaron Shatkin and I were chatting about science, and he mentioned to me that Miura in Japan had found that real virus RNA was methylated and thought it might be a signal for packaging the RNA. I told him that Bob Perry had recently reported that mammalian mRNA was methylated and that I had plans to check whether vaccinia mRNA was too. Next week, I found that vaccinia virus mRNA made in vitro incorporated S adenosyl methionine, that is the methyl group from S adenosyl methionine, that's the methyl donor, and immediately called Aaron to let him know. Now, that's cool. Yeah. Within yeah, a couple of days, cool. he called me to say that real virus mRNA incorporated uh, acetonosyl methionine as well. We decided to submit both our papers to PNAS, and they were published in the same issue. Now, that's just the uh, methyl incorporation. We then independently started to work on the site and structure of the methylated nucleotides. I can't remember who called whom, but we both said that we had solved the structure and did not reveal it to each other. We again agreed to submit the manuscripts to PNAS simultaneously and sent each other a copy to see if we had the same structure. 
you can imagine how excited I was to open the package and see that we had independently derived the same structure. And and that's basically that. And in particular, because this is a really bizarre and complex structure. It's it's not, I mean, at the time, it would not be obvious at all. And I don't, I don't know the details of, of how they did it, but that's cool. I, just, I love that story. That is just, that's such a, such a nice little insight into yeah. uh, what turns out to be a very fundamental discovery. Yeah. And Bernie uh, followed up by saying, you know, the, one of the reasons that these things are, uh, can be discovered in, in viruses is if you purify the, vi- the both Rio and Vaccinia, you can purify the virus and stick it in a test tube and feed it nucleoside triphosphates, and it will make viable messenger RNA that's capped in polyadenylator right there in the test tube. So it's already purified thousands of fold, and you can actually... Uh, we talked about radio labeling a while ago. You can radio label it with nucleoside triphosphates very specifically that have specific phosphates labeled or specific other substituents labeled. You can't do that in cells. Mm-hmm. Among other things, the triphosphates won't get in through the membrane. Um, so you've got to label just with phosphate, and then everything gets labeled. It's a big mess, and there's all kinds of impurities. So the virus is really uh, being able to manipulate the viruses were key to uh, making the discoveries, as it is with many other of these sorts of discoveries. And Aaron Chatkin, of course, died last year. Mm-hmm. He was my neighbor. lived mm-hmm. around the corner from me. I used to see him jogging on Saturday mornings. It was pretty cool. I actually also interviewed with him for a postdoc many, many years ago. Regarded by all as a wonderful, wonderful guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. Very good guy. I have a, put a link to a couple of, to, to a blog post I wrote about him. All right, uh, moving onwards. Now we're going to move into splicing. In the 60s and 70s, it was known, in fact, that in mammalian cells, the precursors of, of messenger RNAs were bigger uh, than the mRNAs themselves. They were bigger and they were different sizes. So they were called... Heterogeneous nuclear RNA. Exactly. I remember going to seminars on this when I was a graduate (laughs) student. Nobody had the slightest idea what was going on. Right. HNRNA. No one could figure out how they were made. It turned out they were capped and they were polyadenylated. So the ends looked pretty much like mRNAs, but nobody could figure out what was going on. And it took two of two guys, two virologists, basically... To figure it out, uh, Phil Sharp and, and Rich Roberts using adenovirus infected cells, and that brings us to slide seven: the discovery of uh, splicing. The first, the first, well, first of all, adenoviruses uh, make a, a number of different mRNAs, in particular, the late, what are called the major late mRNAs, are are quite numerous, and this is what uh, they were studying. Uh, one of the first things they did was to find that if you took the major late mRNAs and digested them with an enzyme called RNase T1, this is an enzyme that I used to work with all the time, RNase T1 cuts after G residues specifically. And what they found was for all the adeno late mRNAs, when you cut them with RNase T1, they all yielded the same capped oligonucleotide. In other words, the 5 prime end with 15 or so bases was the same among all those mRNAs. Hmm. They said, hmm, now we know that all these mRNAs are capped and they're polydenylated. Now we know they have the same 5 prime terminal sequence. So what they decided to do was a really cool experiment. They took uh, these mRNAs, which they could get in quantity as you as you remember from what Rich was saying with with manipulating viruses, and they hybridize them to viral DNA. And they ask, and they look at it in the the electron microscope, and they said, do the mRNA and the DNA match up perfectly, or is there some extra sequence in the viral DNA? And that's what we have in this picture here. This is actually a a tracing of uh, an electron micrograph picture. And what we have is a piece of viral DNA shown in blue. So where it's labeled B in this slide, this begins the viral DNA. And then they have hybridized to it uh, one of the major late uh, RNAs, this one encoding 
uh, the hexon, one of the structural proteins of the virion. And the hexon m mRNA is, is colored green, and you can see it, there's a portion where, where it's hybridized to the DNA. It's thicker. So that's where the mRNA is hybridizing to the DNA. And then there are three very prominent loops of DNA coming off the message. And so basically what we have here is that the DNA has extra sequences. So you have a little bit of DNA hybridizing to the message, and you, the DNA loops out where its counterpart is not present in the message. And that happens three times. And what they found was that the... Um, all of the major late RNAs had this structure. The A and the B loops uh, were the same in all of them, but the C loop varied in size depending on which of the major late uh, RNAs that you looked at. And in the end, what they figured out uh, was that these late RNAs all have a, a, the same 5 prime end piece of uh, RNA, and it's built from three different sequences. Uh, in the DNA, and this is called the tripartite leader. And then they're joined to different mRNA bodies depending on um, what was going to be encoded. In this case, it's a hexon, but it could be a, a number of other proteins depending on how this leader was put on. So the, the diagram at the bottom shows the adenogenome. You can see there are three sequences that are interspersed, and those are eventually going to form the tripartite leader. And then uh, in this case, the hexon mRNA, there's a, another part called C, which is that loop C. So they called this splicing. And, and it blew everybody's mind. Yep. Mine included. Now, did you, you were, were you in Phil's lab when this happened, or you came afterwards? Uh, no. As I, I, I do have a story about this, because I was over at the ICRF when this happened, uh, Imperial Cancer Research Fund in London. And uh, uh, my... PhD mentor was on sabbatical there, uh, not at the same institution, but uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, and Joe Sambrook, who was at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, knew about all this stuff, and he came over to visit the uh, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And here I am, sort of a stupid, naive postdoc. I, I was barely grasping this eukaryotic stuff because I grew up prokaryotic, right? So, And I didn't have any self-confidence. I didn't know what was going on. And Joe came over, and he told me this story. I was the only person <laughs> he could find around, okay? And he told me this story, and it was bizarre, right? Because this was just crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I tried to understand this and tried to assimilate it. <laughs> and la later on, Joan, my advisor, came by and I said, "I got to tell you, this is this is this incredible story." And I tried to, I started to tell her, and she looked at me like, "Boy, are you a jerk? <laughs> you know, you obviously got this all." Right. And I just said, "Oh yeah, okay, I just got this all wrong. I don't get it." You know, we decided that in fact Sambrook had come over and told me this so that I would tell my advisor, Cayman, as a kind of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how unbelievable it was. So I have a story about it, too. Um, I was a graduate student, and this is, of course, pre-internet days. And the story was first presented at a, to a large audience at the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium in May of 1977. The symposium was entitled Chromatin. Um, and uh, as a... Uh, something I read today said it was one of the most shocking findings in molecular biology research. And I have to agree with Rich. The way I found out about it is we, I was a graduate student at UC San Diego, and we would have uh, noon seminars that were internal seminars one day a week, and people would come back from meetings and give meeting reports. And somebody <laughs> came back from this meeting and gave this meeting report. And it was just so amazing and it was fun to see the dynamics of who was most skeptical and and who was most excited about it and I, I have to say that it seemed to me as a young person that the older more established people were more skeptical and the young people were just more excited about it but I think mm -hmm. people really could see how this was starting to uh, answer a, a really important mystery about what was going on with this HNRNA stuff. Mm -hmm. so, the, other, the other thing is that a lot of people had data in their notebooks that they had not been able to interpret and didn't understand, okay, that all of a sudden became interpretable uh, once they knew about splicing. And, and, mm -hmm. and people actually, you know, 
uh, doubted themselves throughout data, whatever, doubted other people because they couldn't interpret it. We had it. There was a there's a polyoma virus mutant that um, has a big deletion in a region in the early region that we thought should logically affect a uh, large T antigen. And we messed around with that forever, trying to figure out, because it didn't, why that was. It turns mm -hmm. out you splice around the deletion. Well, we didn't know that. At the uh, Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, of course, the speakers uh, would put their talks uh, together as papers that would get, then get published as a volume. And uh, evidently, enough people uh, went back and already had data in their notebooks that they were able to add addenda to their talks, mm. Uh, mm. so several other uh, groups in that uh, symposium volume had uh, incorporated some information mm. that correlated with that. <laughs> it's funny. I, I think this may be the most shocking discovery in my scientific lifetime. Oh, definitely in mine. Yeah. Well, it's clearly it's the kind of discovery that was so big at the time that the people who who heard about it remember exactly what they were doing. Yeah. At the time, right. right. Well, so. I'll tell you what I was doing. But I I remember. Uh, it, I was also a student, Kathy, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting in the lab, and Peter Palazzi comes back from a meeting. I don't know which one. And he said, you got to hear this. This is the most amazing thing. And he gets a, people, a piece of paper, and he says, these genes, these mRNAs are made as precursors, and they're spliced. I, I couldn't get this. I said, why would you do this? <laughs> I couldn't get it. It took me a while. It took me a few years before I really understood it. But I remember that moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. Mm-hmm. Remember we asked David what was his most amazing, and he said the discovery of mRNA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he goes good. back a little further. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Maybe that is. It's, I'd have to think about that, but uh, that could be. Anyway, these guys uh, are in the next slide, slide eight. Rich Robert, a Brit. Cool thing was he was working for a, an enzyme company, New England Biolabs. Mm -hmm. And Phil Sharp at MIT. These guys uh, both got the Nobel Prize in 1993. Physiology uh, do you have medicine. the original papers for those? Because we ought to acknowledge the other people as well. I know that on the uh, Rich Roberts paper, it was uh, Louise Chow, Tom Broker, uh, Rich Gelinas, and uh, Rich Roberts. Right. Uh, and the title of that paper was An Amazing Sequence Arrangement at the mm -hmm. Five Prime Ends of Adenovirus 2 Messenger RNA. So how many times do you hear... Amazing, amazing in a in title. The title. Yeah. <laughs> and there was another paper back, uh, Vincent, when you were talking about the 11 nucleotide uh, T1 product from adenovirus messages. Um, so, uh, Gelinas and Roberts had a paper entitled, One Predominant Undecanucleotide in Adenovirus Late Messenger RNAs. Right. So, working undecanucleotide and amazing into <laughs> titles is good. <laughs> and then the, uh, the Phil Sharp paper uh, was uh, Birgit. Moore and Sharp, so right. Suzanne okay. Burgett. Good. Glad you had that. Right. P and, and S, cell and cell, right. And when Rich Roberts got the Nobel Prize, he was at New England Biolabs, but the work was done at Cold Spring Cold Harbor. Cold Spring Harbor. Mm. Right. So, yeah. All right. Now, this, of course, explained um, HNRNA. And then within months, it was shown that this wasn't an obscure virus thing, but happened in eukaryotic cells. Right. Majority of mammalian RNAs are spliced. The yeah. first nine papers, if you put in uh, mRNA splicing into mm -hmm. PubMed, the first nine papers were viral, and then the tenth one was immunoglobulin in August 1978, mm. a year later. So, so this, of course, has uh, and been shown to have huge implications for evolution. You can make new genes by shuffling around. So the exons are the coding regions, and the introns are these intervening sequences that are that are spliced out. And it's appropriate um, and, and logical that the tenth paper on that would be in immunology because this is a huge area of you know generating diversity in your antibody yep. system. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, uh, the next one uh, is uh, slide nine, and now we get into how this works. Many people have then for many years worked on this, and the first thing is many people start to sequence junctions of exons and introns, and this slide shows the result of that. They found there are some very, very conserved nucleotides, and in particular... You can see that the at the five prime splice site, the first two nucleotides in the intron are 100% conserved. 
GU, and then at the three prime splice site in the intron also, it's AG. And then in the middle, there's an A, which is 100% conserved. Many of the other residues within the intron are conserved, but that particular one, 100% found in all sequences. And that'll have relevance for the, the way this happens. So splicing is a pretty simple reaction. It involves two transesterification reactions. Uh, in the first, that A, the hydroxyl of that A, attacks the phosphate uh, at the exon, at the end of the exon, at the junction. And that gives you, now the 5' prime exon has a free 3' prime OH. And then the intron is looped around itself to form a lariat. It's actually called the intron 3' prime exon lariat because it's still hooked up to the 3' prime exon. And then the second transesterification, the new 3' prime end, which was made at the, fi at the 5' prime exon by the first reaction, that hydroxyl attacks the phosphate at the 5' prime end of the exon 2. The lariat's excised, it floats away. And a lariat, of course, is a... Well, that's what it is, a lariat, right? It's got a little... It's got a loop. Loop, and yeah. then it's got a little sequence at the end that you could hold it with and swing it around your head. <laughs> but the loop can't change size, so you couldn't really rope anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so you end up with um, uh, the spliced uh, uh, exons. You have the intron gone, and the 5' prime and the 3' prime splice sites on the exon are joined together as a result of these two reactions. So it's pretty chemically, it's pretty simple. But uh, it has to be really accurate because it turns out that some genes have like 50 introns and they all have to be spliced in the right order. And so there are a lot of cell proteins that uh, participate in this. And there's actually a very big structure called the spliceosome that has these RNAs in it and a lot of different proteins. Spliceosome. That may be the first after the ribosome, right? I think it may be the first zome around, yeah. After ribosome. Okay, uh, our next slide is 10. And this shows you a little bit of what's going on here. Now, um, there are a bunch of RNAs, small RNAs from the cell. Uh, and I'm sure Rich is familiar with these, having hung around the Stites lab for many years. Yeah, year this now. is always, uh, this, all, <clears throat> this all happened uh, after I left, Joan uh -huh. was uh, prokaryotic up through my graduate work. And then, in fact, it's interesting because so these molecules that work on the splicing machinery are small nuclear ribonucleoprotein particles mm -hmm. or SNRPs. That means they have both, they're, they're not real big, and they have some proteins in them and small RNAs. And people knew about the existence of these things for a long time. Joan, on her uh, first sabbatical, decided that she wanted to get a little eukaryotic, and she went over to uh, Klaus Weber's lab. Uh, Klaus had, uh, at the Goethe uh, uh, Institute in uh, Göttingen, not the Goethe Institute, I'm planking, at any rate, the L Ludwig Institute? I'm not sure. At any rate, planking. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, she wanted to make antibodies to SNRPs. Klaus had figured out how to do immunofluorescence. And she wanted to make antibodies to SNRPs and use the antibodies uh, to probe cells and get some idea what the SNRPs was. It was simply a, you know, a curiosity-driven thing. And she found that she couldn't make antibodies to the SNRPs. And it turns out that they're just so highly conserved uh, that, you know, you take a human SNRP and inject a rabbit, and the rabbit thinks it's just rabbit SNRP, okay? Because... So you, she couldn't make antibodies. So she came back. She said, I don't know. I remember talking to her. What are you going to do with your life? She said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good. So she came back to Yale. She was telling this problem to a student in her lab, uh, Michael Lerner, whose father's a dermatologist, Aaron Lerner, at Yale. And Michael says, I know where you can get antibodies to these. People who have autoimmune diseases like lupus wow. make antibodies to SNRPs. Yeah. And she said, oh, great. Let's get some of those. And they got them, and they, uh, uh, that gave them the reagents that they could use to purify the SNRPs by immunoprecipitation and look and see what was going on. And then beyond that, uh, there was really an insight to recognize that uh, the RNA in one of these SNRPs was complementary to the conserved sequences at splice junctions, and bingo. Right. SNRPs all of a sudden were connected with splicing. 
Right, so there are four uh, small RNAs, and they're associated with proteins, as Rich said, and they... And on this slide is shown the sequence of events starting with a pre-mRNA with the intron still present. And it begins to fold up as these uh, SNRPs bind to it. And you can see there is base pairing to the conserved sequences at the junctions and within the intron. And these SNRPs basically arrange the uh, substrate in a way so those two transesterification reactions can occur. Because remember that conserved A has to attack the 5' splice site, and it's got to be near to it. And that's what, in part, these SNRPs do. And you can see in this figure uh, the first reaction and the second one yielding the, the mature mRNA. Now, in addition to the SNRPs, there are about 150 other proteins in these spliceosomes that have uh, various functions. So I was thinking about uh, similarities and differences between ribosomes and spliceosomes. You know, they're both Im involved in very important processes. They both have RNAs and complex proteins and so forth. But it, it looks to me like spliceosomes have a little bit more of a plastic or or fluid structure because these SNRPs aren't necessarily in the spliceosome itself all the time. Is yeah. that right? Is that yes. right? That's Whereas more you dynamic. Think of, yes. Where you think of the small subunit and the large subunit of a ribosome, and they they pretty much have all the same things before, during, and after translation. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that dynamism plays into alternative splicing and that kind of stuff. You have to be a little more flexible uh, so that you can make decisions. Mm -hmm. Whereas right. protein synthesis is pretty much just the same thing all the time yep. once you've initiated. Mm -hmm. All right, now the next slide. Uh, number By the one. way, excuse yep. me, it's the Max Planck Institute. Max Planck. I want to oh, get so that right. Yeah, you were, get you were planking. It was planking. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Slide 11 is focusing on the one of the panels uh, from the previous slide. The point here is that ex some experiments have been done where they produce these uh, RNAs without any protein. In particular, U2 and the U6, uh, when you produce them alone, they can base pair and form a structure. As you can see here, the orange and the blue U2 and U6 are RNAs are base pairing with each other, and they are also meant to base pair with intron sequences. Uh, they can bind an RNA and catalyze an attack that's sort of like that first transesterification. You can do this all in vitro with just RNA. So this is an example of a ribozyme, of course, an RNA with uh, enzymatic activity. Now, the in mammalian cells, the splicing we uh, is is done also with proteins, but we know that there are some very primitive introns which are self-splicing, uh, like those in tetrahymena, and those are presumed to be very, very ancient from the RNA world, and maybe they were the precursors of this uh, splicing machinery, which then evolved to get more complicated and use proteins as well. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, moving onward to slide 12. Now... Um, on the left is shown a, a, a HNRNA with uh, three exons and two introns. And if you splice out both introns and you get a, a, fi a final mRNA, in other words, you remove all the introns, that's called constitutive splicing. But many mRNAs uh, undergo what's called alternative splicing. You can take one precursor and make several different uh, messages from them. So you could do alternative splicing, you could remove one or... Uh, you could skip an exon, for example. You could have all three exons present, or you could skip one by splicing over it. You could use different three prime splice sites, or or different five prime splice sites. So basically, you can get more than one mRNA from any particular gene, and you can get different proteins. For viruses, this is good news because you can expand their coding capacity. Uh, there are many examples, polyomas and adenovirus, where a gene can uh, specify multiple proteins by these uh, alternative ways. You can and imagine, this, yeah. This produces an incredible amount of of modularity for for evolution. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. you can you can take introns from one enzyme and pop them into another and get the same activity in a different context, and and that appears that sort of thing appears to have happened frequently. Yeah. Yeah, when the f human genome was sequenced, people were really shocked that there were only thirty thousand genes, and, and they, you know, they felt like that just wasn't enough because we're so sophisticated. <laughs> um, uh, but first of all, that's a bit of hubris, and second, uh, you know, thirty thousand is just uh, that's 
a, a, a vast underestimate because yeah, there's yeah. this uh, opportunity for modularity. Yeah. It's not the size of the genome. It's how you split. It counts. Right. Yeah, this kind of splicing can also give you temporal regulation. You know, you can have at one part of the infectious cycles one kind of splicing to give you one protein and then change that later on. So mm -hmm. really flexible. Mm -hmm. And so this is alternative splicing, and it's often combined with uh, regulation of polyadenylation to give you lots of different choices. Um, so the next slide is slide 13. And this is an example of alternative splicing and polyadenylation uh, in um, bovine papillomavirus. And what we're looking at here is a map of the DNA genome. These are circular genomes normally, but it's been linearized here for simplicity. And there are two mRNAs that are produced from a precursor, which are alternatively spliced as the L and the L1 mRNA. And the difference uh, between them is a splice site and a different polyadenylation site. And uh, on the right is an in situ hybridization, which shows that the L1, the alternatively spliced L1 mRNA, is in fact expressed very in very specific cells, and in in the very the highly differentiated keratinocytes uh, at the tip of the uh, papilloma or wart in this case. So there's some there there is believed to be regulation of splicing uh, depending on the differentiation state uh, of the cell. And this is a pretty complicated matter here. It's not all been sorted out as far as I know. But the next part of this image shows a, a close-up view of uh, the area where alternative splicing occurs. And uh, the, the, the point I want to make here is that there are a number of proteins, and these are all part of the splicing apparatus, a variety of different names, which bind to uh, sequences uh, near the splice site. And they can they can regulate splicing, and they can either positively or negatively uh, regulate splicing. And so in this case, it's thought that the differentiation state of the cell somehow is impacting uh, the splicing reaction and leading to alternative splicing. So this has some, some impact on the virus, of course. I'm always impressed when I look at stuff like this. I'm, uh, uh, nature really is making this up as it goes along. Oh, you know, yeah. oh yeah! It's all really Rube Goldberg. <clears throat> it's amazing that it evolves to do this, isn't it? It's just incredible. I'd love to see all the intermediates and what it started from. <laughs> yeah. Can someone provide? Well, that? actually, you're already <laughs> looking at intermediates to something that's going to be out there when yeah. you're pushing daisies. I'll be gone. You let me know, okay? Sure. <laughs> yeah. You just all, all you really have to do is go back in time four billion years. <laughs> And oh. take samples and time points. I have know. always wanted to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Get a time machine, go back, take some samples, and see what you got. Um, on the bottom is a... So in order to get these two messages, these two splice variants, you have to do polyadenylation at, at two different sites. And um, that's interestingly regulated by a, a SNRP binding to a... There's a pseudo-splice site in, this, in, the, in the HNRNA for this uh, messenger RNA and the binding of the SNRP there, it's not a real splice site, that inhibits poly-A polymerase. So that's one way of inhibiting polyadenylation at one of those sites by one of, by these uh, splicing factors being bound to it. It's just very cool. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, what's the saying? You couldn't invent this. You couldn't make this up, Couldn't right? make this right. up. You couldn't make it up. <laughs> if you were making it up, you wouldn't go to all this trouble. Right. Yeah, and nobody believed you. Yeah. You'd make it simpler. All right. Now, I'm going to talk now about some sort of unusual ways of uh, regulating splicing. And the first example is uh, on slide 14. And this is um, in cells infected with what are called simple retroviruses like Rouse sarcoma virus and related virus, where the genome is a plus strand RNA, which is, of course, reverse transcribed to DNA, but then that DNA, when integrated in the host cell, is transcribed by cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and then you make a capped message. And this, uh, from this, uh, these simple retrovirus genomes, you make a pre-mRNA, which is unspliced, and that encodes for the GAG and the Paul proteins, the structural proteins and the polymerase. But in order to translate the envelope glycoprotein, the message has to be spliced. So there's a single splice that occurs. Now, the ratio between these two species, the unspliced and the spliced mRNA, is very important. If you mess with it, which you can do by mutating splice sites, you, you mess up 
viral replication. So the ideal ratio of unspliced to spliced is 2 to 1. If you mutate the genome to make it 1 to 1, you reduce replication. And if you make it 1 to 2, uh, you don't get any virus. So this ratio is really important for many, many reasons. So how do you regulate this splicing? Well, the virus does it in a number of ways. One is that the 3' uh, splice site is not very good. It's not a great acceptor site, so you don't get a lot of splicing. So that's why you have, a, in part, a 2 to 1 ratio. And there are also uh, interesting sites which are called negative regulatory sequences, or NRSs. These are basically decoy uh, splice sites. They attract SNRPs, uh, which then bind there, but they don't produce a splice mm. because they're decoys and they're missing they're missing sequences. And so this uh, inhibits splicing, and that's another way that you regulate uh, the splicing reaction. So I thought that was a cool way of mm -hmm. uh, of regulating the amount of splicing. Now this is pretty simple. Adenovirus is like way off the charts, and that's in the next slide. <laughs> and this is coming back to Adeno, where, of course, splicing was discovered, and we're looking at a map of the double-stranded DNA genome at the top, and we're looking at the late mRNAs, and these are all produced from the major late promoter. The, the, the precursors are, can be quite long, and they're processed into uh, quite a few uh, late mRNAs. Um, so there are five different polyadenylation sites that give rise to these major late transcripts. They're called L1 through L5. And the virus during infection will polyadenylate at each of these, and that gives you uh, HN transcripts, if you will, or precursors of different sizes, from a short one to intermediate to long. So polyadenylation is regulated. There is a, a protein in the cell called um, CSP, cleavage stimulatory protein. And what that does, it cleaves the RNA at the poly A signal, and that's the initiation of polyadenylation. And what, what adenovirus does is to inhibit the activity of that protein as infection proceeds. And it turns out that the first polyadenylation site is the most dependent on this protein for polyadenylation. So as a consequence, when the activity of the protein is modified, you get a gradient of polyadenylation. So you, get a, you can get all the sites utilized and not just one. Uh, then you have alternative splicing occurring to give you even more variety. Each of those primary transcripts with different poly A sites is spliced. First you have splicing to give the tripartite leader, and that is then spliced onto two possible three prime splice sites in one case or four possible in another. So there are many different possibilities to give a variety of different protein coding regions. And those alternative splice sites seem to a bit depend on the initial polyadenylation sequence. So you have five different poly A sites and that will determine where the three prime splicing from the tripartite leader is going to occur. So again, there's a common tripartite leader on all these messages, which is produced by splicing. And then depending on where polyadenylation occurs, you can get even more uh, alternative splicing. And, and this is a really nice illustration, I think, of the the kinds of things that splicing the RNA enables. Yeah. Because adenovirus has a has an incredibly, I mean, for the, considering the size of the genome, it has this regulatory cascade of events and an orchestration of of different gene products being produced and different activities going on that's that's vastly larger than it has any right to for for a genome that size right yeah it's very cool <laughs> also also I just want to point out that although we're looking at late messenger RNA splicing, it happens for the early messages that are made, and so that adds an incredible amount of uh variety in the functions of proteins that, in fact, some of them, some of the early proteins are involved in regulating this splicing, That's such right, as yeah. um, in exon inclusion and exon skipping and things like that. Right. I think we have... It's a lot of work to figure all that stuff out. Oh, yeah. Years and years. I guess, yeah. no, I guess nobody does this anymore, right? Oh, uh, no, they <laughs> still do. They still do? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised they're getting supported for it, to be honest, because uh, people don't have very much patience for this sort of thing. <laughs> it's unfortunate because it's good stuff. Yeah. 
the next one um, builds on this. This is slide 16. Again, this is how uh, adenovirus um, late messages are, are regulated. This is late the L1 pre-mRNA, so it's one of those late messages. So at the top you have the L1. Remember, that's the pre-RNA produced uh, by polyadenylation at the first polyadenylation site. So this apparently can be made early in infection. Even though it's major late promoter, it can be made early in infection. And when made early, um, only the three prime splice site is used, which gives rise to the uh, L1 mRNA and the 52-55 kilodalton protein. And that's because SR proteins, the SR proteins are part of the spliceosome. Uh, they bind um, the, th the three prime splice site and they block. Uh, the other splice from happening. So early in infection, you only get the 52-55 KD uh, mRNA made. So just to clarify what you said, mm. in the diagram, there are two three-prime splice sites. One of them is more five-prime and one is more three-prime, or one is more to the left and one is more to the right, if you're looking at the figure. So right. at early times, the more three-prime one on the right is the one that's blocked. Yeah. Okay. And you only get that one... Uh, L1 mRNA made. Mm -hmm. Now, late in infection, uh, a, a viral protein called E4 induces dephosphorylation of the SR protein. So, in other words, for the SR proteins to bind this splice site, they're phosphorylated. The E4, together with a protein phosphatase, dephosphorylates the SR so they can no longer bl bind to that 3' prime splice site, uh, and then it can be spliced. Uh, and give rise to the, the other mRNA, the 3A mRNA. And there's another viral protein shown here, 33K, which is apparently um, needed to get splicing there as well. So it's amazing how, I mean, this is just one mRNA, and this incredible amount of detail that we know about this, but uh, this is what you can do with a viral genome. All right, now... Um, the next slide is a, is a diagram of something we need to talk about next, and that's RNA export. So all the mRNAs we're talking about are made in the nucleus, uh, and they, in order to be translated, of course, they have to get out into the cytoplasm uh, where the ribosomes are. And we're looking here at, at how cellular uh, mRNAs and, and many viral mRNAs as well would be exported. Uh, the, the RNAs are exported as RNA protein complexes, and specifically... Export depends on the presence of this protein called TAP, T-A-P. Now, TAP doesn't bind to the RNA directly, but it binds to proteins that are deposited on the mRNA during the splicing reaction. Okay, so when the mRNA is spliced, remember it binds, it's part of the spliceosome, and there are a number of specific proteins bound to it that mark it for TAP binding, and that allows it to be exported. So spliced mRNAs are marked... Uh, for pro for export uh, out of the nucleus. Now, most viral mRNAs utilize the same machinery. Um, cellular and viral would use this machinery, but there are a number of viral mRNAs that are either incompletely spliced or not spliced at all. So how would they be marked for export then? How do they get out of the nucleus? So this is where it gets cool even cooler because the viruses have evolved to do things differently to get around these problems and that's shown uh, one example is on the next slide number 18 and this is a cell infected with hiv the hiv genome is shown and the hiv genome is of course integrated into the host cell dna it's transcribed into a long messenger rna uh, which can then um, be spliced into a variety of different mrnas um, which make different proteins. Now, early in infection, uh, the first transcript is spliced to a number of uh, smaller mRNAs, which are then exported and translated into proteins. So nothing unusual there because those are completely spliced uh, and they're, trans they're exported and translated. But in order to access uh, some of the viral uh, genes, there have to be uh, incompletely spliced forms. So how does it do that? Remember, if you're not completely spliced, how do you get out of the nucleus? Well, what HIV does is early on from some of these completely spliced messages, it makes a protein called REV. 
So Rev is made in the cytoplasm. It's shipped back into the nucleus where it binds a sequence on the uh, mRNA precursors of HIV called the Rev responsive element or RRE. And the binding of Rev allows incompletely spliced messages to get out of the nucleus. And those can then code for some of the other proteins that aren't coded by the fully spliced messages. So the virus has evolved this way of dealing with this. And so Rev basically allows uh, not unspliced or fully sp un not fully spliced messages uh, to get out of the nucleus. Crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. Now, how does Rev work? Well, this is a little pretty detailed here, the next slide, but I thought we should talk briefly about this. This is slide 19. Uh, normally, things get out of the nucleus via the nuclear pores. There's a, there's a transport machinery that uh, exists in the nucleus consisting of a variety of proteins that interact with cargo, typically with protein sequences, and um, they get recognized by the nuclear pore and, and shipped through in an energy-dependent fashion. So as we said earlier, mRNAs get shipped out by virtue of proteins that are bind to them, and those proteins bind to the export machinery. Well, that's what REV does. REV basically sits on the HIV REV responsive element and then interacts with the nuclear export machinery. And that will then ship it out into the cytoplasm. Proteins then can fall off the mRNA, and uh, the mRNA can be translated. So it forges itself a ticket out of the nucleus. It does. It forges it, exactly. And so there are ways to do everything, apparently. <laughs> Evolution <laughs> knows no bounds. <clears throat> it's very cool. So remember, it has to do this with REV because if it doesn't splice, it's not marked for export. So these, aren't, these mRNAs are not fully spliced, but they can still get out. It's pretty cool. All right. All right, one more example of this. Um, we talked about some retroviral RNAs that were uh, unspliced earlier. The simple retroviral genomes encode a single RNA that's only spliced once. Now, they don't have as simple retroviruses. They don't code things like REV. So Rouse sarcoma virus doesn't have a REV. It just has gag, pol, and envelope. So how does it get out? Well, the unspliced retroviral RNA has at its 3' prime end a, what is called a constitutive transport element. CTE. And this binds TAP, just like REV binds the REV responsive element and then REV binds the export machinery. Here, TAP will bind this, this element in retroviral RNA, and particularly unspliced retroviral RNA, right? And allow it to get shipped out of the nucleus. So instead of forging its, its ticket, it steals it. It steals the ticket. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Anyway, there, right. there are other examples of this, but. Just so that you know, if you're not spliced, you can still get out of the nucleus. All right. Is that clear? Yep. Mm -hmm. I got Outstanding. it. I think our next slide is a summary of all this, 21. Uh, viral proteins that regulate RNA processing reactions. We talked about some of the ad proteins like the dephosphorylation of SR. A couple of other in, uh, interesting examples here. There's There are a couple of ad proteins that inhibit... Um, export of cellular mRNAs. So the virus wants to uh, restrict the mRNAs in the cytoplasm to its own. So it's got proteins that do this. And then the 33 kilodalton L4 that promotes alternative splicing, we talked about that. Herpes virus also encodes uh, proteins that uh, modify splicing and polydenylation and as the retrovirus rev element. And as, as we said, this, is, this allows you to temporally regulate gene expression or inhibit the production of cell mRNAs, which, of course, is always good. All right. That, that really does it for splicing. Uh, I wanted to talk about one other form of RNA um, modification that uh, happens in, in uh, RNA viruses. It was actually discovered. It's called RNA editing. It was discovered in trypanosomes. Uh, in the uh, mitochondrial messenger RNAs. And what they found, this was in the 80s, I think, they, U residues were appearing in the messenger RNAs of these trips that were not templated. So they were added post-transcriptionally. So that was called RNA editing. And it was found subsequently in a couple of viral mRNAs. And slide 22 shows you editing in measles uh, RNA. Now, measles is a negative-stranded RNA virus. 
and the viral polymerase makes individual messenger RNAs. And here in this slide, we're looking at the messenger RNA uh, encoding what's called the P-protein. Now, most of the time when the polymerase copies the genome to make this mRNA, it makes a, a, a faithful copy, and you get a P-protein made, as you can see on the right. But sometimes as the polymerase is copying the template, it pauses at a UC-rich area, always the same area. And when it pauses, it tends to slip back a base. Uh, and then when it finally resumes copying, you've ended up adding an extra G to the mRNA. So that's editing. You're adding a G, but it's not templated. And the, the effect of that on the reading frame is to change it. So now you have a different protein from that point on, and it's called the V protein. So it's a way to get two proteins from uh, a single gene. There's a cool example of this in Ebola virus genome, which is on the next slide. Uh, again, this is a negative-stranded viral RNA, and it makes uh, the polymerase makes indi individual messenger RNAs from that template. The, there is a gene called the GP, or the glycoprotein gene. When produced by faithful copying of the template, the gene is the mRNA is translated into a soluble secreted glycoprotein. When RNA editing occurs at a specific site during transcription of this mRNA, that changes the reading frame past the editing site, and you now get a membrane-bound glycoprotein. So That's cool. It's very cool because the glycoprotein for Ebola is made by editing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is for all strains, but certainly for this, this particular strain of Ebola, that's the case. And people have altered this editing site to try and find out what this does. Why do you make a secreted form, for example? So if you make a mutation right. so that the virus only makes the membrane-bound form, this virus is highly cytopathic. It makes very small plaques because the virus kills cells very quickly. So in some way, the secreted form is modulating the cyto toxicity of the virus, and that's all regulated by editing. And I think mm. that's pretty is it, cool. Is it acting in some way like a sponge or a, a um, competitive inhibitor or something for what the membrane glycoprotein has to interact with? It might, yeah. A neighboring cell? I, I think it's not known, okay. but that's a possibility, yeah. So it goes from being a non-structural protein when it's secreted to yeah. being a structural protein when it, yeah. And that's, it's, it's cool because it's non-templated, right? It's just, right. It's really neat. Yeah. Um, and one more example of um, editing. In one of my favorite um, viruses, the hepatitis delta satellite virus. <laughs> and this is a, I don't think we have talked about, well, a long time ago maybe we talked about satellites. Really uh, yeah, no, I don't know. We talked about them in great detail before That's before be everyone. This was when me and Dixon were doing this years <clears throat> ago. But we okay. can we should revisit it someday. So the hepatitis Delta satellite is a virus that can only grow in uh, hepatitis B virus infected cells because it's encapsulated in its coat, and the genome is a circular single strand of negative sense RNA. All right, really unusual, and it's very small. It's about one point seven kilobases. And um, in the cell, this negative strand uh, genome is um, transcribed by probably by Paul II, amazingly. It's an RNA template being transcribed by Paul II to make an mRNA. And the mRNA then is translated to make what's called the small delta antigen. The small delta antigen is needed for the genome to replicate. At some point during this process, there's, a, there's an enzyme in the cell called double-stranded RNA adenosine deaminase. It changes a stop codon uh, in the plus-strand RNA. It's usually a UAG. It changes it to a UIG, so it deaminates the A, and you get an inosine. So now you have UIG. And when that's copied to the minus strand, you get an ACC, the, a, the I is, co is templated to a C, and then when that's made into mRNA, you now have a tryptophan codon. So basically the editing has changed a stop codon to a trip codon, and now you get a longer protein, and that's called large delta. And large delta is what you need to encapsulate the genome into the hep B capsid. 
So again, <laughs> you got an editing event that is essential uh, for the encapsulation of this virus. It's really through cool. a convoluted mechanism. Oh, say well, the Crazy. whole the whole replication of this satellite is incredibly yeah. convoluted, yeah. and someday we should talk about it. But it is just amazing. This is a cool uh, satellite here, and that's RNA editing. Any questions? Yeah, about a thousand. <laughs> you know, not but, any uh, we can answer. I don't think. No. Can I tell my sort of uh, geeky molecular biology joke? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's really more related to uh, transcription and polyadenylation, which you guys talked about before I was on. But um, so the signal for where polyadenylation uh, is going to take place is a sequence that's A A U A A A. Uh, and uh, one of the graduate students in Arnie Berg's lab, where I was a postdoc, uh, Craig Montel, was working on a project that was doing site-directed mutagenesis of this sequence. And we just called it A2UA3 because, as Craig said, it kind of sounds like you're studying it. A -U -A -A. So, <laughs> so we called it A2UA3. And uh, also, if people have listened to the uh, previous uh, TWIV 101 about uh, – Transcription, you know that the uh, transcription start is signaled by a TATA box, TATA -T -A, and an AT rich region. And one day as I was leaving the lab, I said to Craig, Ta ta, and he called out A2UA3. Uh, that's our title. <laughs> that's good. Ta ta. A2UA3. All right, uh, we're going to not do email today so that you can really focus on that 101, but we do have some picks of the week, right? Yeah. Always yep. picks. And um, let's start with Rich. What do you have? Well, um, I have. I made a video for a uh, pick of the week, uh, and it's all explained in the video, but I'll do it really quickly here. There's a um, I saw a, an interview with Linus Pauling a long time ago where, among other things in the interview, he gave a demonstration of how he explains science to children that has to do with uh, holding up a, a small cardboard box that has obviously some sort of object in it and uh, moving the box around and it uh, makes a noise uh, because the object inside it is moving around in the box and the question is, what's in the box? And I think it's a fantastic demonstration of what science is because basically um, we, we're basically trying to uh, understand things that really we can't see. All right? And we use all sorts of peripheral, indirect techniques to try and measure these things, you know, microscopes and scintillation counters and film and all this kind of stuff. And as you're making these indirect measurements, in your mind, you create an image of what it is that you're, that you're trying to, uh, to see. And, I, you know, I can, in my own mind, I've done this, you know, for so long, I can feel these images sort of being created. One of the magical things, I think, is uh, uh, X-ray crystallography, because there, uh, although you're still using indirect methods, you get out the end of it a structure that probably is what you have been trying to illuminate, though it's not necessarily the whole thing. And it's, it's remarkable, after many years of thinking about an enzyme, to see what it actually looks like. At any rate, I think it's a, a, a really nice demonstration uh, of the process. Mm -hmm. So I made a video that shows that demonstration. It's cool. Rich makes a video. Yes. And I, I tried to do collaborative science with you, Rich, to see if we could figure out what was in the box, but um, maybe you missed that. But uh, well, uh, you uh, <laughs> you wrote me an you wrote me an email with right. uh, with a hypothesis about right. what was in the box. I chose right. not to respond because I figure in this particular case, <laughs> I'm not a scientist. I'm God. Oh, I, okay. I made the box, right? Well, so I'm so, not. I'm not saying anything, whether you're so, right or wrong. So I need somebody from your lab to no, go no, do no, because uh, some, <laughs> some of them know the answer. 
Now, I did have a conversation last night uh, around dinner. We had guys night out and went and saw a bloody movie, okay? Uh, and when I went over this, and uh, Nassine, who is in my lab and who got the answer pretty quickly, said it makes a difference to be able to actually hold the box and move it around uh, relative to actually just seeing the video. Mm. So that's interesting. Because he was able to apply another instrument to the pro uh, to the problem, but in fact, more science is more often like watching the video, <laughs> or or actually, science is more often like like listening to that on the radio. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, you can't touch it, right? Most you can't touch time. it. You can't quite tell what's going on. You don't. Yeah. You, you just kind of yeah. playing it along. It's true. It's amazing we get so much done. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Good job. Uh, Alan, what do you have? I have um, a, a site. It's a gallery of underwater photography. Um, and uh, it was put together by this guy, Alexander Semenov, who is a um, – uh, he works at something called the White Sea Biological Station in Russia, um, which is a uh, – it's a marine biology lab, I guess, sort of a Cold Spring Harbor type of place or um, – or a woods hole that's up in the northwest part of Russia um, must be brutally cold. But he um, he runs the diving team there, yeah. and so he he decided he would you know he was really interested in some of the stuff he saw, and he started taking pictures of it. Wow. And these I, I find these absolutely stunning. And if you've ever tried underwater photography, um, the amount of technical skill that goes into producing this sort of stuff is is really really impressive. Wow, these are, these are very yeah, nice, gorgeous. Yeah. Some over water too that are really nice. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, he, some of these he takes in fish tanks. He takes uh, the samples inside and shoots in a fish tank. But these are these are creatures from from Arctic waters, so they're stuff. They're not the usual reef fish that you're accustomed to seeing from Jacques Cousteau. They're it's unusual stuff. Mm. Let's get their viruses. Man, I'm glad yes. I'm not diving in that stuff. Diving under the ice? Yeah. No thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I know. You like the warm on the boat stick, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And some, as you said, Vincent, some beautiful uh, Aurora pictures, That's too. great. Yeah. Some beautiful. Yeah. yeah, he's got some nice shots nice. of that. Kathy, what do you have? Well, I have something that my colleague Alice pointed out to me, and it's uh, I'm a virus rap. And uh, it's got pretty good animation, and I think the scientific content is pretty good. I played it uh, at the beginning of my class yesterday before class started uh, for the students who were early to appreciate. Uh, so I think it's just a fun video about viruses. You're spending a lot of time on YouTube lately, Kathy. <laughs> no, I am not. <laughs> I can tell you. But, yeah, this one was I watched great. this. I agree. It's really uh, it's terrific. It, uh, there's a whole... Subsite here called it looks like this guy oh this guy does all these science mm-hmm. music videos yes so I he's got raps about of those. all kinds of stuff cool yeah so. very cool all right mine is a very simple pick it's a comic from bizarrocomics.com. dot com it's two two uh, snow people and it's <laughs> snowing and one of them says look stem cells <laughs> I just love it. That's really good. His Bizarro Comics is pretty bizarro if you go to the whole site, but he does all these things. And we have a listener pick, and I think, Rich, you ought to read this one. Uh, okay. If you have it there, I don't know if you're looking at it or... Uh, yeah. Got it. So, Tom writes, hello again, Twivome. I was delighted to hear Rich's uh, pick of the 1956 Bell Labs film, Our Mr. Son, in Twiv 213. I first saw it in the early 60s in junior high school, and being on the a- AV team, I got to see it and Hemo the Magnificent from 1957 more than one. Man, the AV team. I, yes. I probably don't do this anymore. <laughs> you an AV nerd, Alan? Yes, I was. All yeah. right. <laughs> you got to, because you could run the 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 16 millimeter the 16 projector, millimeter you got to go projector, around from yes. classroom to classroom and uh, watch movies. It's cool. Um, these films, two of nine produced, employed a very distinctive presentation style with the host interacting with a, quote, fiction writer, unquote, asking questions and with animated characters that represented and explained the subjects at hand. 
Um, two memorable moments from Hemo the Magnificent still stick in my mind. In the first, Hemo, a tall Greek statue-like animated character representing blood, surrounded by a collection of animal supporters, challenges the host, Dr. Research, to define Hemo in just two words before allowing him to continue. Dr. Research's answer, seawater, causes the animals to laugh derisively, but Hemo shushes him, Mm -hmm. bows to the host respectively, and urges him to proceed. I still remember this moment from my delight in discovering the power of scientific insight. The second moment appealed to my preteen perspective when Dr. Research interrupts and hushes an over-enthusiastic kidney who wants to explain exactly how he disposes of what's left after cleaning the blood. (laughs) All of this came back after, came back to me later, in what I offer as a listener pick of the week, in the 1967 James Coburn film, The President's Analyst, it's a lighthearted espionage story. Oh, it's the 1967 James Coburn film, The President's Analyst, a lighthearted espionage story embedded in a perfect hippie summer of love time capsule. In the final scenes, the evil organization that trumps the movie's versions of FBI, CIA, KGB, and a host of other foreign forces is revealed as TPC, the phone company. Coburn's character confronts the head of TPC, who then, in classic supervillain forms, explains his nefarious plans. He does this in the same narrative style as the Bell Labs films, complete with a cheerful little animated character representing the chip that TPC wants to implant in everybody's brain. A hilarious tribute to Bell Labs and Frank Capra. Tom and Austin. Very nice. Thank you. I haven't seen that movie. I'll have to have a look. And then he's got, he uh, um, put some optional uh, uh, trivia from Wikipedia, which I won't go into. Uh, There were a lot, there was quite a cast of characters in these films, and you can look it up on uh, Wikipedia and see Eddie Albert, Lionel Barrymore, um, Mel Blanc. Yeah, Mel Blanc. It's incredible. Hit a nerve there, Rich. (laughs) <laughs> yes, at least one person. That's good. Glad, yeah. glad, glad to hear. I have another pick from Danielle who says, I doubt I'm the first person to direct you to this, but there was a Twitter trend this past week called Overly Honest Methods. She gives us the link for that, and those are some Twitter cool things on Twitter. Like, uh, I used 3,000 RPM because the centrifuge made too much noise at 4,000, stuff <laughs> like that. It's overnight good. incubations ran overnight for 12, incubation. to, 12 yeah. to 20 hours, depending on how many pubs I hit that night. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> that was one of mine. It was? Yes. You contributed. <laughs> so that's what you were doing. Yes, that's <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Additionally, I would like to thank the entire team for the advice they gave to the grad student in TWIV 211. You gave this grad student a much-needed perspective. I'm still trying to figure out whether that perspective will lead to relief or panic, but in any case, it was extremely helpful. I guess that's the one where the student was asking whether they should quit or not, right? Mm-hmm. I think so. All right. Anything else? <clears throat> Anybody want to say anything? I'm looking at this one. Heat shock of E. coli was performed at 42 to 43 degrees C for exactly 45 to 120 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are good. It's a good idea, whoever started it. Uh, a couple of people did send this in, as you might expect. Yeah. All right, we're back to TWIV 1. No, we're back to Virology 101. So should we continue? Cause oh, yeah. Because next would be translation. Yeah, we got to finish this, and we got to keep yeah. up. We got to do a, a better pace. It's too slow. No, it I just, mean, we got a better, oh, oh, yeah. better number Sooner. of episodes. Yeah, Sooner. once a month, maybe, right? We should yeah. do the translation like episode that. in some other language. Good idea. So it would be lost. <laughs> yes, and of course, that'll be the title, right? <laughs> right, right. Do it in Japanese. <laughs> Twiv can be found at twiv.tv, iTunes. And if you like TWIV, go rate it over on iTunes. It really helps us. We also have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash This Week in Virology. We love and your questions. if quest- you don't like TWIV, keep it to yourself. Yes, please. <laughs> I had a, This reminds me, Alan. I, many years ago, um, there was a molecular biologist called Brian Seed. Does anyone know that name? I know the name. Mm-hmm. That's very familiar. So we got a vector from him, and it came with instructions, a plasmid vector, and... Um, pages and pages of instructions, and at the end he um, said, 
if you have any problems or complaints, just drop dead, okay? It's <laughs> <laughs> great. I still have it. I still have it. I should put it on the web. Um, questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Kathy Spindler can be found at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Always. Rich Conte. Ta-ta. 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 Uh, A2UA3. There you go. I don't know what I'm saying. I know what you're saying. <laughs> Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Great to be here. Great to be back. At least when he's not on a sailboat. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's okay. I'm just jealous. It's good fun. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure it is. And Alan Dove is at alandove.com and on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'm not on a sailboat, but I, I do have a nice view from the 13th floor here. It's very lucky. I don't know what I do when, when I'm not here anymore. I'm not going to have this view. I'll, have to have, I'll make like a 24-hour video and just play it all the time. That's a ways down the road. All right. Who knows? Yeah, I'm sure just, it's a just put a webcam in there. Yeah, know, put a webcam before That's you leave. Idea. You know, I did that once because someone stole some audio equipment from my office, and mm. so I put the webcam on on my computer for 24 hours, and I was watching it. I could see the the, the sunrise and the sunset, <laughs> and nobody came in, of course, for like a week. So I stopped doing it. Uh, you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We will be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Do you want to be funny or not funny? Oh, we've got to be funny. <laughs> okay. Or try. There's the one with uh, a couple of introns in it. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what are, the, are those based on any sequence, or you just? No, type? I just I just typed uh, UAs, CGs, Gs, and processing viral RNA. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. I kind of. Yeah, like I like that. that. Maybe we could put the, uh, the put a cap on it as a reference to a pop song. I don't know how many people will get that. I didn't. <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. We're the ones that were around when splicing was discovered. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so what's the most amazing thing that happened in your lifetime, Alan, molecular biology wise? Uh I would have to say um Myrna's. Mm. Okay. Mm. Small yeah. small RNAs. That that just that's totally out of left field. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean and I was out of the lab when that when those were discovered, but I remember seeing the, the first papers on them and th- thinking it, it what? <laughs> no, that doesn't. No, that's ridiculous. <laughs>